So welcome to Robbie's Reading Corner. Follow me. So come with me as we look at works in the public domain. Hello and welcome to Robbie's Reading Corner. I'm your host, Robbie Macbeth, and today's short story is The Looking Glass by Anton Chekhov. Before we begin, I'm just going to give a brief biography of Anton Chekhov. Uh, it says here, uh, Chekhov was a Russian physician, dramaturg, and author who is considered to be among the greatest writers of short stories in history. His career, his career as a dramatist produced four classics, and his best short stories are held in high esteem by writers and critics. Chekhov practiced as a medical doctor throughout most of his literary career. Medicine is my lawful wife, he once said, and literature is my mistress. Chekhov renounced the theater after the disastrous reception of The Seagull in 1896, but the play was revived to acclaim in 1898 by Konstantin Stranislavsky's Moscow Art Theater, which subsequently produced, also produced Chekhov's Uncle Vanya and has premiered his last two plays, Three Sisters and The Cherry Orchard. These four works present a challenge to the acting ensemble as well, to the, as well as to audiences because in place of conventional action, Chekhov offers theater of mood and a submerged life in the text. Chekhov had, a first, had at first written stories only for financial gain, but his artistic ambition grew. But as his artistic ambition grew, he made formal innovations, which have influenced the evolution of, modern, of the modern short story. His originality, originality consists in an early use of the stream of consciousness technique, later adopted by James Joyce and other modernists, combined with a disavowal for the moral finality of the traditional story structure. He made no apologies for the difficulties this posed to readers, insisting that the role of an artist was to ask questions, not to answer them. So without further ado, I present to you The Looking Glass by Anton Chekhov. <clears throat> New Year's Eve. Nellie, the daughter of a landowner and a general, a young and pretty girl, dreaming day and night of being married, was sitting in a room, gazing with exhausted, half-closed eyes into the looking glass. She was pale, tense, and as motionless as the looking glass. The non-existent but apparent vista of a long, narrow cor corridor with endless rolls of candles, the reflection of her face, her hands of the frame, all this was already clouded in mist and merged into a boundless gray sea. The sea was undulating, gleaming, and, not, and now and then flaring crimson. Looking at Nellie's motionless eyes and parted lips, one could hardly say whether she was asleep or awake, but nevertheless she was seeing. At first she saw only the smile and soft, charming expression of someone's eyes. Then against the shifting gray background there gradually appeared the outlines of a head, a face, eyebrows, beard. It was he, the destined one, the object, object of long dreams and hopes. The destined one was for Nelly everything, the significance of life, personal happiness, career, fate. Outside him, as on the gray background of the looking grass, glass, all was dark, empty, meaningless. And so it was not strange that, Seeing before her a handsome, gently smiling face, she was conscious of bliss, of an utter, unutterably sweet dream that could not be expressed in speech or on paper. Then she heard his voice, saw herself living under the same roof with him, her life merged into his. Months and years flew by against the gray background, and Nellie saw her future distinctly in all its details. Picture followed picture against the gray background. Now Nellie saw herself one winter night knocking on the door of Stephen Lukic, a district doctor. The old dog hoarsely and lazily barked behind the gate. The doctor's windows were in darkness. All was silence. For God's sake, for God's sake, whispered Nellie. But at last the garden gate creaked and Nellie saw the doctor's cook. Is the doctor home? His honor's asleep, whispered the cook into her sleeve, as though afraid of waking her master. He's only just come from his fever patients and his orders he was not to be waked. But Nellie scarcely heard the cook. Thrusting her aside, she rushed headlong to the doctor's house, running through some dark, stuffy rooms, upsetting two or three chairs. She at least, at last, reached the doctor's bedroom. Stepan Lukic was lying on his bed, dressed, but without his coat, and with pouting lips, and he was breathing into his open hand. 
A little night light glimmed faintly beside him. Without uttering a word, Nellie sat down and began to cry. She wept bitterly, shaking all over. My husband is ill, she sobbed out. Stepan Lukic was silent. He slowly sat up, propped his head on his hand, and looked at his visitor with fixed, sleepy eyes. My husband is ill, Nellie continued, restraining her, her sobs. For mercy's sake, come quickly, make haste, make haste. Eh, growled the doctor, blowing into his hand. Come on, come this very minute, or it's terrible to think, for mercy's sake. And pale, exhausted Nellie, grasping and swallowing her tears, began describing to the doctor her husband's illness, her unutterable terror. Her sufferings would have t touched the heart of a stone, but the doctor looked at her, blew into his open hand, and not a movement. I'll come tomorrow, he muttered. That's impossible, cried Nellie. I know my husband has typhus. At once, this very minute, you are needed. I er, have only just come in, muttered the doctor. For the last three days I've been away, seeing typhus patients, and I'm exhausted, and I myself, I simply can't. Absolutely. I've caught it myself. There. The doctor thrust before her eyes a cl clinical thermometer. My temperature is nearly 40. I absolutely can't. I, am, I can scarcely sit up. S excuse me, I'll, I'll lie down. The doctor lay down. But I implore you, doctor, Nellie moaned in despair. I beseech you, help me for mercy's sake. Make a great effort and come. I will repay you, doctor. Oh, dear. Why, I have already told you. Ah! Nellie leapt up and walked nervously up and down the bedroom. She longed to explain to the doctor, to bring him to reason. She thought if he only knew how dear her husband was to her and how unhappy she was, he would forget his exhaust exhaustion and his illness. But how could she be so eloquent enough? But how could she be eloquent enough? Go to the Zimvesto, doctor, she said. She heard Stepan Lukic's voice. That's impossible. He lives more than 20 miles from here, and time is precious, and the horses can't stand it. It is 30 miles from us to you, and as much as from here to the Zem Zemsvo, doctor. No, it's impossible. Come along, Stepan Lukic. I ask you a, a, an heroic deed. Come, perform the heroic deed. Have pity on us. It's beyond understanding. I'm in a fever. My head's in a whirl, and she won't understand. Leave me alone. But you are a duty bound to come. You cannot refuse to come. It's egoism. A man is bound to sacrifice his life for his neighbor, and you, you refuse to come. I will summon you before the court. Nellie felt that she was uttering a false and undeserved insult. But for her husband's sake, she was capable of forgetting logic, tact, sympathy, th sympathy for others. In reply to her threats, the doctor greedily gulped a glass of cold water. Nellie fell to entreating and imploring like the l very lowest beggar. At last, the doctor gave way. He slowly got up, puffing and panting, looking at his coat. Here it is, cried Nellie, helping him. Let me put it on for you. Come along, I will repay you. All my life, I shall be grateful to you. But what agony. After putting on his coat, the doctor lay down. Nellie got him up and dragged him to the hall. Then there was an agonizing to-do over his galoshes, his overcoat. His cap was lost. But at last, Nellie was in carriage with the doctor. Now they had only to drive 30 miles, and her husband would have the doctor's help. The earth was wrapped in darkness. One could not see one's hand before one's face. A cold winter wind was blowing. There were frozen lumps under their wheels. The coachman was continually stopping and wondering which road to take. Nellie and the doctor sat silent all the way. It was fearfully jolting, but they felt neither the cold nor the jolts. Get on, get on, implored Nellie, Nellie implored the driver. At five in the morning, the exhausted horses drove into the yard. Nellie saw the familiar gates, the well with the crane, the long row of stables and barns. At last, she was at home. Wait a moment, I, I will be back directly she said to Stephen Lukic, making him sit down on the sofa in the dining room. Sit still in a while, and I'll see how he is going on. On her return from her husband, Nellie found the doctor lying down. He was lying on the sofa muttering, Doctor, please, doctor. Yeah? Ask Domna, muttered Stepan. What? They sat at the meeting. Vlasov said, who? What? And to her horror, Nellie saw the doctor was as delirious as her husband. What was to be done? I must go for the Zemstro doctor, she decided. Then again, then again there followed darkness, a cutting cold wind, lumps of frozen earth. She was suffering in body and in soul, and delusive nature has no arts, no deceptions to compensate these sufferings. Then she saw against the gray background how her husband, every spring, was in straits for money to pay the interest for the mortgage to the bank. He could not sleep, she could not sleep and both racked their brains so their heads ached, thinking how to avoid the visited, being visited by the clerk of the court. She saw her children, the everlasting apprehension of cold, scarlet fever, diphtheria, bad marks at school, separation, 
Out of a brood of five or six, one was sure to die. The gray background was not untouched by death. That might well be. A husband and wife cannot die simultaneously. Whatever happened, one must bury the other. And Nellie saw her husband dying. This terrible event presented herself in every detail. She saw the coffin, the candles, the deacon, and even the footmarks in the hall made by the undertaker. Why is it? What is it for, she asked, blank, looking blankly at her husband's face. And all the previous life with her husband seemed to her a stupid prelude to this. Something fell from Nellie's hand and knocked on the floor. She, she, started, jumped, she started, jumped up, and opened her eyes wide. One looking glass she saw lying at her feet. The other was standing as before on the table. She looked in the looking glass and saw a pale, tear-stained face. There was no gray background now. I must have fallen asleep, she thought, with a sigh of relief. That was Anton Chekhov's The Looking Glass. Thank you for watching.